And I think we can start with some rugby. And hopefully we have on the line um, Ruahe DeMont, who was a big winner, as were the Black Ferns at the dinner last night, the New Zealand uh, Rugby Player of the Year Awards. Uh, Ruahe, a good afternoon to you. And first of all, congratulations. Boy, that must have been... A, you've had a few special days and special nights in the last month, but that must have been something very special last night. Yeah, last night was um, very special, uh, very special to be... Um, firstly nominated, um, you know, up against some some world-class players who have um, been massive pioneers for women rugby in the 7s and 15 space um, in recent times with, with the professionalism of our sport. Um, so to be to be nominated alongside Sarah Hedeney, um, Teresa Fitzpatrick, Stacey Flula, and and also um, TJ Perinata as well. Um, it's it's a massive honour and very humbling. Yeah, so, how did you feel when you heard your name called out as the winner of the most prestigious individual title in New Zealand rugby, the Cal Tremaine Award? It was yours, your name called out. How did you feel? Um, I, I think it's just I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit weird, I guess. I don't. I can't think of a better word to to describe it. Overwhelming. Um, and, yeah, and well, I guess it's just strange because you know we 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 play these team sports and we don't do it to receive any individual accolades um, because you're always working in together with the team and so to be recognised, I guess, with such a and receive such a prestigious award, not only that but also um, Māori Player of the Year is is, is a huge honour for for me and my whānau. <laughs> Well, you didn't have to get to training this morning at 9.30 and you're not playing tomorrow, so I imagine it was a bit of a party at DC. Can you tell us about the uh, after-awards party last night? Oh, actually, I did have training this morning and I am at training right now. So um, there wasn't much um, awards and celebrations last night, but um, I know that in the next week... Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to heading back home, and so the celebrations will continue with um, many members of my whanau who I haven't had the opportunity to see in the last couple of weeks. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. So you were training this morning, what for rugby? Rugby training this morning? Yes, just yes. Wow. Um, what, what's yeah. uh, what? This is what early season conditioning for 2023. Yeah, so we're kind of just wrapping up um, our last bit of training finish off the year, um, but also um, kind of, I guess, jump-starting on the pre-season for, for our Super Rugby Opiki season next year. Mm, that's right. It's going you know, to be another very big year for you. Um, I suppose at times over the last month, you must have must be wondering if your life is ever going to be uh, the same again, given the fact that you're now living permanently in a, in a fishbowl, aren't you, at the moment? Yes, yes, that's absolutely right. <laughs> I didn't expect, um, I think... I, you know the the attention that our our team especially received over the World Cup. I wrongly thought that that would probably go away mm. once the World Cup finished, and it, mm. it hasn't. Um, which is again a really privileged position for many of us in our team to be in. You know, like not only um, as players, but real ambassadors for the game, and also role models for um, not just young girls but young boys in our communities. So um, we're very privileged. Yeah, yes, and I think, yeah, okay, you'll probably just get your breath back again and then you'll be off to the Helberg Awards in February, so it could be another big night there. So just tell me about the, the road trip that you've been doing, um, going around the country, uh, giving young people, old people, everyone, an opportunity to meet and greet you. How has that gone and, and where is it? Is it finished? Yeah, so um, since the World Cup, it's been... Um, our, our team, not just um, us as individuals, but our team and many members of our team have had the opportunity to um, take the Rugby World Cup back to their hometowns. Um, you know, the place where for, for many of us who still play at a community level of rugby, um, we attribute our, our starting point and so much of our rugby journey too. So to be able to, to do that as a, as a wider squad has been... Um, Heartwarming, to say the least. Um, that that tour, that thank you tour, hasn't finished, and um, there's still a number of us who are yet to take um, the trophy back to our whanau, back to our hometown, so that you know we can not only inspire, but so that mm. you know, mm. in mm. small communities, young whanau, young kids can see that you know people like like them have have been able to 
you know, um, follow their dreams and pursue their passions, mm. um, regardless of where they come from or the restrictions that may seem like a place on them. So that's probably been the coolest thing and will be the coolest thing. And I think it's great that uh, someone in your position now is co-captain of this national team is so acutely aware, and I hear this from you all the time, and I see it from many of the speeches and interviews that you've done, this uh, acute awareness that you have, and I imagine your teammates as well, um, to see that the uh, victory in the Rugby World Cup final can be transformed into uh, seeing more young women playing rugby and the sport growing and being developed. And um, it is part, of, I guess, of the responsibility of those who are at the top. And sometimes I sometimes think I look around in sports and I don't think uh, too many or a lot of people who reach the top realise that, but it's uh, something that's very important to you and I imagine all of your teammates as well, this role of promoting women's rugby in New Zealand, right? Absolutely. I think... Um one of the unique characteristics that women's rugby has as opposed to men's rugby is um, firstly, there's a much smaller number of players across New Zealand who play, or, you know, of females that play rugby in New Zealand. Um, and because of that, especially um, when it comes to women's rugby, there's a, there's a massive drop off after school girls rugby. Um, it's very common for um, players, regardless of their age or experience levels, to come to your club trainings and be training alongside black mm, mm. And so that um, that passion for the grassroots level of rugby, that um, willingness to give back to your community, to go out into your communities, into the schools, into the um, the clubs who may be struggling or, you know, um, don't have enough girls to put together a 15s team but maybe be, may be able to pull together a 10s mm. or 7s team. It's not something that's uncommon in the women's space and, and you have you often have players giving back in other ways as well to their communities and stay involved with the game long after they've finished playing. And so it's been an example that's been set by um, by many players who have gone before us even now and is the example that's um, continued to be set and followed by many of the players who are involved in top end rugby now. Mm. It's a wonderful thing, and stick to your guns because it's very important. Just a couple of things to finish with. If you go back to the, uh, f- to the Rugby World Cup, can you identify, or even maybe prior to the Rugby World Cup, can you identify a time or a moment where you realise that um, uh, what was taking place within this team was something special and that uh, the memories of that difficult tour that you had to the Northern Hemisphere last year were gradually being buried and that you sensed that something big might be looming once the Rugby World Cup got underway. Did you did you have that moment at all? Um, I don't know if there was a single moment. I, I, I don't think I can place my finger on a single moment that happened where I had that moment. I had that thought that crossed my mind. There were definitely moments where, you know, as, as players who were involved in camps and tours and campaigns, where you recognised and felt the difference between previous tours and previous campaigns or teams that we had been involved in. And um, the the first campaign that we were involved with was the Pacific Four Tournament back in June. And uh, so many of us at that time, you know, said that that was one of our favourite tours we'd ever been a part of um, because we felt things that we'd never felt and we'd learnt things we'd never learnt. And... Um, it was challenging. The game plan was challenging. It was difficult, um, but it was really enjoyable. And we were not only valued as players, but as people. And and it was just it was just very different. That's all. So um, mm. Mm. yeah. And, and and then it, it, it things just kept building from there. Um, but you know, um, yeah. It, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, anyway, once again, congratulations on um, the awards that you and your. Um, other players from your team picked up last night and uh, fully deserved and um, I do hope that you can find some peace and quiet and equanimity with your whanau uh, over the Christmas holidays and let it all sink in and um, come back fresh in January for 2024 in a very big season. Ruahe de Mont, thank you very much for your time today on the platform. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. That's uh, the co-captain of the Black Ferns. It's uh, coming up to 20 minutes after 1 o'clock.